So we invited probably one of the biggest, I'm not going to say the biggest, but maybe he is, a uh, Lebanese Sorry. vlogger. Size wise too. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you probably have the highest traffic in the country. Uh, to come and give you this, this talk, because if anyone, I'm sure he's been contacted by hundreds of people saying, if I pay you 50 bucks, will you write about me? And he hasn't. And we really like his integrity and the way that he deals with this. There are brands, like I know you like Red Bull and you've worked with them. There are brands that he'll work with, but it's probably because they approach them differently. So we asked him to come and, and share his experience with you guys. Okay, uh, I'm Gino, I'm Gino's blog. Uh, it took me a while to choose my outfit today. <laughs> I'm not a fashion person. Uh, I just like well. usually what's, uh, I like what's uh, the easiest thing I can wear. So anything, my hand falls on usually. But uh, when Marie told me, you know, uh, they'd like a chance to maybe understand a bit the blogosphere in Lebanon, how to approach it, I, I was glad to come. Because every day I get so many press releases which mean absolutely nothing to me. Like uh, a washing machine <laughs> or uh, a kid's playground. And the kid's playground, they were very insistent and that, that I go. <laughs> so it would be a bit weird if I was uh, you know, an old man with a big beard surrounded by small kids. And, uh, because they really wanted that anyway. So I was hoping to clarify those things. Maybe it will help you with the rest of the bloggers. Uh, I'll just tell you a bit about the blog. There's so much sadness all the time, and there's thousands of Lebanese blogs. Not hundreds, not dozens, there's thousands. Most of them are based in Lebanon. Lots of them are expats who write about Lebanon. But very, very little people actually put some good news. Now, the good news is usually silly stuff, like uh, Lebanon's women are part of the sex seven most sexy women. You know, silly things which aren't really backed up. So I'm trying to find the good news uh, recently, and that's been doing a trend. And one of them is going to be a, a Lebanese-born fashion designer I found. Uh, it's called Michael D. Oh, so he's not famous yet. <laughs> OK, the blog. Uh, this is, I'm just going to tell you a bit about the blog, if there's many of you who don't read it. And I'm going to give you the numbers, which not a lot of people get, so you get an idea of what kind of numbers you should be having in Lebanon if it's, if it's to be considered successful. Uh, my blog is very Lebanese oriented. I barely write about topics not related to Beirut, except when it's stuff like tech, because uh, I'm a bit of a geek. Uh, there are about 2.3 million hits, which I'm very proud of. I started out as an AV project, and I write about uh, literally everything. And I have a few fashion posts. OK, these are the numbers. Uh, the numbers, they switch a bit, uh, depending on the content, always. So you're never going to get a fixed number of hits. Because this isn't Facebook, this isn't Google. No one will open it every day uh, to check it. So it depends on what you write. September was a really good month. Uh, this month, it's, got, it's gotten a bit better now. I did this graph, uh, I think, a week ago. What's so unique, unique hits? Unique hits is as unique people. So it's one person, different IP address. The hits is how, the total. So one person can see more than one hit. And if I'm not mistaken, these two weeks, because there was so much good content, they're at 70 something thousand uh, unique hits, which is awesome. You never know. I'm very proud of it. This is one thing, so you know I'm legit, and I had to do this. Okay. These are from where the hits come from. And that's really important for me personally. It's more, yeah, it's more important than the quantity. 62% are from Lebanon, which is uh, awesome. Because I, I don't get a lot of hits from search engines, which are not relevant. Because I don't write anything that isn't relevant for Lebanon. Uh, the funny part is, Kamena, a lot of GCC countries, they're as much as the US. Uh, and if you think of it, most internet users in the world are American. So it's good. They're probably expats living there. Yeah, and I've learned that uh, the, the most religious followers are the expats. And the news never really shows. Uh, the stuff people care about, something you see on the street or a new pub or anything. It's always uh, which politician visited which guy and who killed who. So, Kamena, you should always look at where the blogs are coming from. But Kamena, no one accesses a blog for fun. Uh, they access it for fun, I'm sorry. No one accesses it because they have to. So you have to have a social media presence, which is awesome, Kamena. So when you're choosing a blogger to work with, make sure that they, can, they have a weight also on social media. For example, I was just at uh, an opening of Magnolia Bakery. I'm not going to write about that because no one really cares. No one wants to read a post about the uh, opening of a bakery. 
But posting it on Instagram and Twitter generated a lot of interaction. You know, there's already lots of contents where exactly, wow, that's awesome news, blah, blah, blah. So the brand got what it wanted. It got people to know that it's open. And the blog's content stayed, uh, if you want, the integrity of its state. Now, no one wants to read something about Magnolia uh, after a post about Syrian refugees, for example. It doesn't really fit. But they want you to so they can send to the client that uh, they got earned media online. <laughs> Another really important metric I care about is how much time they spend. Because uh, it's really important how much time they spend on, the, on your website or blog because it shows how much they care about the actual content. So I put a couple of, like Anhar and Daily Star, which I think are good. They get around four minutes and three minutes. I got two minutes for seven seconds, which is awesome. And I got, I searched the few blogs I know which are fashion. I found that one on Anhar, which is also a friend. She's at two minutes coming, which is awesome. And usually I think their posts are usually mostly photos, so we don't really spend that much time. But they are spending a couple of minutes, which is, uh, I think, impressive. Uh, this is the part where I sort of try to tailor make, make it to uh, you guys, fashion people. Because uh, the biggest blogs in, in Lebanon aren't really fashion ones, like Blog Validate, Plus 961, these guys, most of them are guys who uh, joined that into fashion, I guess. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. I think the stuff we should care about one is the language. If you guys are trying to reach the Lebanese people, it's always to go uh, with English, always. And the people who will care about the content you're creating probably do speak English. But if you're targeting the rest of the Middle East, like uh, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, which are the really big players in the Arab world, you have to write in Arabic too. What I'm doing is I find writing Arabic hard, because I can speak Arabic fluently. So what I'm trying to do now is I write in English, and I produce uh, multimedia stuff like videos in Arabic. And if you think of it, in Lebanon, our internet isn't really helping, so no one watches videos yet. But in the Arab world, it's the, like Saudi Arabia, is the biggest consumer of YouTube. Imagine, yeah, the country we think of as really, um, okay. if you want, which conservative but like oppressed, they're the people that consume the most videos. So these people don't want to watch a video in English. They die for a video in Arabic, which is basically non-existent, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, the audience come in. I think you should focus on what audience you want. And gender, I don't know if you guys know this, but most internet users are women, not men, most of the time. So uh, I think that's already made. Does anyone do fashion for men? Here? Uh, okay, good. Because I so I don't feel very sexist. Maybe. Okay. In this room, Sarah has a Yeah, I'm starting to. Okay, awesome. Uh, so, come in, like, I sort of went over that if it's Lebanese or Arabs and if it's gender. So, luckily, on my blog, come in, uh, women are overrepresented, so I'm glad about that. Uh, content type, come in, written or multimedia. I think some fashion bloggers are starting to experiment with video, which I think is awesome. Because it's different when you actually see the stuff they're wearing, how they, how, you know, if they move, how it reacts and stuff. So, I think that would be an awesome place you guys could uh, look into. Okay, this is my favorite part. When I give to people, bloggers will never write. They don't have to write about anything you do. Then no, they're not a magazine you have contracts with. So you can send them a press release for immediate release, and they release it. Because there's usually no money involved in this, so they don't have to. If you're doing something good enough and relevant to their blog, they will write about it, even without you telling them. Which is what happens most of the time. If I find something interesting, I don't really care who's doing it. I'll write about it anyway. The only thing I read about immediately is uh, charity stuff. I don't and it, I know because I believe in it and I think it should be done. Even if it uh, doesn't perfectly fit with my content, I will always try to give it a push. So never, ever do it. Never approach a blogger to increase the marketing, uh, the earned value, which a lot of marketers like, which I'm not sure how they measure yet. But uh, yeah, if you think of it, Filing a report for a client or for your company that, yes, we got six blog posts. So you have to think, you know, were those blog posts good for you and for the blogger? And then, uh, for example, when someone approaches me like $200, write a post about this new movement. I'm not going to write about it because I don't like it. I don't want to get the $200, then and never not everyone talks. Everyone will know you got paid. Second day, I look at the blogs and I see people posting it. And I laugh. I'm like, you know, come on, guys. 
200 dollars isn't that worth it. You can a bit more, maybe. But I think uh, I don't think you guys gonna, are gonna pay for it anyway. We might kind of bribe them. It's okay if they don't feel bribed. And if what and if what you're doing is good enough to be written about, and even if you do bribe them and they do write the stuff, if it's something boring. No one will care. So the only thing you'll have is a a page on a, on a website in in space, cyberspace. Bloggers love exclusive things. No, no, we're not like uh, NBC and MTV. They all have the same news. So it doesn't really matter who breaks it first, because they all air it within a few minutes of each other. But on the internet, it matters. So lots of times I post something, and I get a private, like what Najib from Blogbed was saying, fuck you, you put before me. Yeah. Same thing happens to me. Because for us, it's really important if you have something exclusive and if you break it first. So if you're ever working on something cool, and you're sort of keeping on under the wraps, you could collaborate with someone and release it with them. And we've been trying that recently. Usually I used to break into places and uh, being constructed and try to get the info. Because I used to go to printing presses to see what kind of tickets are being printed to know what you would, if, which event is coming. So I used to... <laughs> That's part of it. There's a lot more techniques. But, but now we're working like if I, if I know of a new uh, artist in town, and they approach me, I listen to their music and I like it. I try to do it in a way that I get exclusivity to release their stuff if you want to the public. I keep not release it for money-wise and contract-wise, but you know, get the, the scoop myself, which is awesome. Why? And they get, the Venice people also love to, everyone, not even the Venice people, love to know something they think they shouldn't know, always. And if you do it in the right way, it can work. I, keep, I prefer doing it myself and yeah, doing the dirty work uh, going down there and listen. Probably I won't know if uh, someone's doing a new song in some studio if, if they don't tell me about it or someone close to them tells me about it. So I think, custom and fashion, I think when you guys have lines or seasons, it would be nice to maybe collaborate with someone and release that sneak peeks or something with them. Because Anjad exclusivity and uh, the scoop is really important when you think of online. Never pay, I'm not, we try never to pay bloggers. Because uh, haram for you guys, one. <laughs> well, two, the only thing that's. All the bloggers aren't experts, well, in their field at all. Maybe Nasri is. But uh, we're talking about the blogs like Musan. Najib is a banker. I'm a biologist. Uh, I think Ram is in consulting, the plans as well. So none of us are really experts. We're not food critics. We don't review stuff uh, professionally. Like Musan, I don't like onions and garlic and hot food. So I'm not really a good food, crit food critic. But when I write, I try to write That's about the experience. Yeah, I made it a bit hard. <laughs> Nothing, I just eat bland food. But it's, more, it's more like about the experience. So if you're asking a friend about the place, what they tell you. It's not like a meal for two plus wine is 100,000. It's more than that, sure. Uh, so I guess, yeah, yeah. Then you'd be, it'd be sort of like an ad, which is, listen, the nice thing about the blog, the only thing people go to a blog to is because they believe it. Mm -hmm. And when I want to buy a phone, I don't go to the Samsung or Apple website. I go to the bloggers I'm familiar with and see what they have to say. And I don't really care about how many milliampere's or mobile show those silly specs. I care about if it falls, will it break? How long will the battery really last on 3G and Wi-Fi? So same thing can apply to uh, blogs, you know. I, I always like to have the honest, free content. Pay for ads, though. <laughs> okay, internet users, this is just... We have 2.7 billion people on, on the internet, and 2.6 million of them are Lebanese, so almost you know, more than half the population is online in Lebanon. And if you want to go into Facebook metrics, I think in March, when we were at Facebook, they said there were 1.8 million Lebanese users on Facebook per month, and 1.1 million of them go on Facebook every day. So you have 1.1 million Lebanese people on Facebook every day. And 40% of those are on mobile. So you now we still, we still, most of us are still not grasping the fact that it's on mobile. But think of it yourselves. You don't really check Facebook on your laptop anymore. Barely ever. Unless maybe you're writing something about it. You always check it on your phone. You scroll through your newsfeed. Oh, Facebook is making it in a way that I saw Marie was talking about the Facebook ads. And so if a page has 10,000 likes, a small percentage will only see 1,000, 1,500, too, if, if it got lots of interactions. So they want you to pay today. 
which is a lot better than what, what most Lebanese brands do. They buy lights, which is stupid for several reasons. One, people will notice. Two, they are ghost users. They will never interact with your page. Three, they're practically the same price as a Facebook ad. The Facebook, the good thing about Facebook ad is, I went through that already, but so no, it, you can really target the people you want. And these people are real people. So it's nice. You know, I tried it with a $50 voucher, and it got like 350 likes, which is a massive yeah. yeah, if you target it uh, right. And I think Facebook was uh, overdoing it, so they make me pay more. OK. Now I'm going to suggest a few useful tools which people use, because lots of times people ask me who are the best bloggers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's hard, because it depends what you mean by best blogger. LebaneseBlogs.com is a, a really awesome website uh, made by a friend, Mustafa, he's the, of BeirutSpring.com. He lives in Nigeria, but he's managed to... Ghana, Ghana. Shh, don't tell him. <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa. <laughs> so, uh, he did something really awesome. Uh, he grouped every single blog which is written by Lebanese from Lebanon abroad or about Lebanon. He grouped them all in one place and he divided them up even. So you can see fashion. This is the fashion and style tab. So look at the, um, you know, lots of times I discover new blogs. I go on Lebanese blogs all the time. But personally, I go on to see if my, how many of my articles are in the top and the hot, hot posts. I'm never in this one. <laughs> but in the old one, I usually am. So I go on for that. But when I scroll through, I discover new blogs all the time that I probably would have never found out. Many of them are anonymous. Many of them are not Facebook friends. So it's really hard to get to them if you don't go through Lebanese blogs. So this is also a good tool because you see which blogs uh, have clout if you want in the fashion world. Because the top five, you can see if, if that same blog is always in those top five, then people are reading them. And what's nice is that if you click on the blog, you can have their contacts too. So it's like an awesome database for virtually every single blog which has to do with, uh, with Lebanon. And you have everything in design, food, to politics, business. So he really did an awesome job. And it's very nice, very simple. It's just an image with the title. And it keeps scrolling down forever. So as long as you keep scrolling down, you'll keep finding the post. So personally, if I, you know, if I was working trying to find a, a good blogger, I'd go on this website, the key. I, I, I clicked one just to show you if we, how it the appears. It's on La Madalana. You have the Facebook and the link to the blog. Usually you have your emails too, and you have their posts. So it's really a streamlined interface, which tells you everything you need to know, so you can better, if you want, choose the kind of uh, uh, blogger you guys want to work with. OK, these are a couple of things. As, as a non, not person not really into fashion, uh, these are the stuff I stumbled upon. Uh, I, I follow Eddie Saab because uh, when I was young, I got baptized in one of his dresses. <laughs> so on my Instagram account, my, uh, my bio is, I've worn an Eddie Saab dress, true story. Okay? So I follow him, he's a friend of the family, for, but he's an established brand, and he's a huge icon. So they don't really post anything, they just post a nice photo and leave it there. And they'll get 15,000 likes to it. But so, uh, a few friends of mine who I follow started a brand called Young Wilderness. I think it's nice what they're doing, Lano. They're sort of building the brand in front of the Instagram users. So they take a photo of whatever fabric they got, they take a video when they're shooting stuff and they upload it, 10 second video which anyone can watch. So it's nice, I think they're sort of building like a following before they even properly launch. So I think a lot of people, myself included, don't really know what goes into the process of creating things. No one knows what fabric you guys might use or the inspiration head. So I think giving them a glimpse into the, you know, the, if you want behind the scenes look, I think would be a nice idea. Personally, I think so, myself. Uh, I was trying to sort of compare like the established huge guys. They don't need to do anything. They just, they'll post anything that get likes. Because the new guys need to post stuff which people care about. They're like, ah, oh, I'm so I was like, ah, oh, hey, we saw a photo shoot, for example. Oh, wow, I didn't actually know they actually get the thing and do a pants out of it. I thought it just comes like that and they have tags. But it's nice to give people a uh, behind the scenes look. I think the only thi thing I really know how it was made was plastic pills. Only because Rowan is a friend, I know. She explained to me, it would be nice if someone, I think, does that. 
And this is the thing I said about the blog, a kid is the foundation of a, of a blog. If, it does, if the blog doesn't get enough hits, not credible enough, it's useless. It's coming out, the other a really important one is having presence on social media. Uh, like the Magnolia Baby example I gave you, there's a lot of things I never write about, but they do get exposure just because I'm there, which is nice because I, I want people to know where I am, what I'm up to. It's cool, you know, they're like, I like my readers. I like them to know what they do. I, I reply to everything they send, every comment they put. So it's not really like a broadcasting stuff. I like to have a relationship with everyone who reads the blog. So like I like to find out that some, sometimes if I see something on Instagram, I ask them, where is that, what is that? Can you give me details? And I write about it. Same thing about me. Today I'm here. I'm going to this party, blah, blah, blah. Which really helps. If they don't have that much clout on social media, all you're getting is a blog post. And I don't think that's really enough. So YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, the girls, social network, and Tumblr. And they need to be yeah, cool offline. So I'm not saying I'm not cool, but I'm saying my friends are. Well, I'm usually in the nice places. So I'm not a person who just hides behind their laptop and uh, Google News is everything and puts it there. I actually go to these parties. I actually go to where uh, there is uh, clashes happening and I take photos of myself. So I'm, I'm present offline too. It's not only about the online, because online yeah, it's, it's like fighting wars with, with likes and tweets, which is, which is really important to get people aware. But to be really credible, you need to be actually there. I can't try to review about a place if I don't go, go, don't go try it. I can't write about the refugees if I don't go actually see them. I can't you can write about the fashion show if I didn't go. You can, I can comment on something because it's in Milan and I can't go there. But at least the local stuff, you need someone who's really in the fashion industry, a blogger, who knows the, a few fashion designers, knows the process. Which best they have a nice blog, which they made for the CV. Which is another thing I think, if you want to know if a blog is good, make sure it doesn't help you on the CV. Because Anna, if I put the blog on my CV, no one will care. The lab won't really care if I have a blog or not. Whereas a lot of marketing people, they have to do a blog, and that's why they do it. So they do a blog to do a blog. They don't really have anything to say, which I think is uh, annoying. I went through that too. I'm not keeping up with my own presentation. So, you, don't, you need the bloggers, they never need you, very rarely. So make them need you, do something really nice, give them something exclusive, approach them and uh, like, call them by their name. I get lots of emails which say, dear, come on. <laughs> <laughs> or partner. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not partner. But, uh, it's, not, it's not a magazine, this is really important, which marketing agencies are really aren't getting yet properly. And try not to tie them all down with, with contracts. I see a lot of bloggers miss and tipping up with Vero Moda or whatever or something. That's not nice because you're limiting them. And the brand, people will see it as a yeah, mishtru. So this is a bad thing which goes both ways. Because if you sort of yeah, ne, give a, re, a big advantage to a particular brand, one, they say they fail, well, they fail, no? Second, they say it's well brand, I'm still bloggers. So it's bad for both. And we don't really trust the blogger that I know it feels like, so, yeah, yeah. it feels pushed like they're... Hey, it, you know, the, that's the really nice thing about the blog. Okay, the bad part is when you get uh, bashed by a blogger. That's really bad. Can but you give, hopefully you won't get to that point. Can you give us an example of someone who approached you in a cool way? In a cool... Red Bull. Because some, someone mentioned it now. At Red Bull, there's no money exchange between us, because they invite me to all their events. And the last thing they have invited me to was in Dubai, the Red Bull Music Academy thing. Okay. So for that, I was just like another artist there. There was no strings attached. Oh. I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. Mission or tweet this today, tweet that, write this blog post. Blah, blah. And at the end of it was just one big blog, blog post and Instagram to, and tweets, which I would have tweeted anyway. So the only thing, and they, they facilitated, of course, me going there because they booked my hotel and my ticket. Because they asked for nothing in return. Usually, uh, you know, if you invite someone, they probably won't go to something they enjoy. Like, I enjoyed this. I met so many people I never would have imagined meeting, like Derek May, which uh, was one of the fathers of techno music. And it's in a, in a place, uh, it started in a place I don't think you guys would think of as uh, Detroit. No one thinks of the US as electronic music. But house music and techno music started there. 
So, but you never really know, because when you go on Wikipedia, there is no information. So sitting with that guy for two hours and telling us those stories was amazing. And, uh, you know, it created content which is relevant not just for me and my readers, but for everyone who will ever look for how techno started and how Derek Ming was. So if you want, the Red Bull thing was an opportunity to me to go to a place I wouldn't have afforded to go. And because I'm not a musician, I come in, I wouldn't have been selected if you want. But because it always happens in Lebanon. That's kind of like the definition of public relations, where you don't actually pay the mason. Exactly. They do. Because it's so good that you'll have to write about it anyway. Like if there's something bad, I wouldn't have written maybe. I would have written something. I'm mean, so I would have probably written something bad too. <laughs> But uh, as a, like the last point, if the content is good enough, or the event is good enough, or the product is good enough, they write about it without you. You know, they they they're not waiting at home to see me or in the You know, they're like, "Show me see it. This is nice. I'm gonna write about it." So most of the time, we don't even have to approach them. Plus, it would be nice, like, if after they write review, and you weren't the one who invited them or told them about it, uh, say thank you, you can or start a relationship. That would be nice. No one ever thanks me for my reviews. <laughs> but you know, I, someday it might come. If, does each blogger has, you know, do you have a, if Mishniam, as a topic that you're into it, you, and somebody who's into that topic will go to you, and then there's a blogger who's into yeah. fashion, and then if, Yani, Most of the time, yes. Yani, it's, you're divided into yeah, areas of yeah, yeah. Most of the time, yeah. like, like you saw on Lebanese blogs. But some of the blogs, like mine, are very loosely defined. Because I literally write about everything. From uh, a misspelled English sign to heavy stuff like uh, human rights and freedom of speech. So many, many of them, or at least the blogs that get the traffic, aren't that specialized. Okay. You know, at the end of the day, one topic will never have so much content. The sign per day, I can write four or five posts because there's so much I can write about and there's no limit. But a lot of the time, hey, someone starts to blog because they're passionate about that one thing, and they keep doing it. But most of the, the big ones uh, are yeah. all over the place. Yeah, so you know, it doesn't everything. Yeah. yeah. You double with the stuff, you know. It's a market yeah. issue. Like, there are 3 million of us. There are 270, last time I checked, in school in America. So if you're blogging about a very specific okay. subject, that is specialized, there are more chances that you'll have a bigger market in a bigger country in a, in a specific language. That's the real reason. Uh, I'm sorry, Nasri. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's happening? Okay. I didn't really do a lot of posts because I'd much rather you guys ask so I know how I can help best. So. Please feel free. Would you write about uh, fashion? If Sometimes I do. Man, if, if you guys think it's relevant to, to my readers, then hatta, even if it's like my sister has a punk rock band, but I hate that music. <laughs> I've never written about it, even though it's my own sister. My childhood friends a punk, punk rock band. Punk rock. I, I never wrote about it, so it's really about if, if I really think the readers will, will enjoy it or not. Now, I think the first foray into rock music was uh, because of Nasri's uh, influence. <laughs> and I was like, you know, this scene is huge. I need to start getting into it a bit. So I started with Wicker Park, and I'm sort of trying to, and the Redmond Music Academy thing, I started exploring stuff which were non-electronic. But it's still, for example, electronic music is still my thing. So fashion, so I like the plastic pills stuff because they were, they were cool. Okay. You know, they said funny stuff or witty things, and I like that. Usually when I have a t-shirt on, uh, it's either Simpsons or has a joke on it. And there's always, I never wear it in an Auckland swimming team. Like, <laughs> someone just goes into the store and buys it. Why would you buy that, you know? It says nothing about you. So I really always try to get a t-shirt which says something about me. So I guess, yeah, if it's something... Uh, related to you. Related to me, or something I can relate to. Uh, okay. A kid, no one's going to do a fashion <laughs> line <laughs> related to me. <laughs> If I can relate to it, if I can relate to it or see myself wearing it, and I'm also a very brand lawyer, so if a person likes something, I'll really stick to it. Like, uh, so I've never worn Converse, and I probably never will. Even though they, I go to their events, I enjoy the scene, head up, but I've never put them on, and I don't think I will. I like men's, folks, I know I'm stuck to that, so several things. 
like uh, Apple and like Android and iOS also. I'm Android, so <laughs> if I don't find an Android app, I'm not going to review it, and I'm not gonna really going to use it. So there is that obstacle with me sometimes. But as I'm saying, if there's something fun or different about it, I will, even if it's not my, my field. I will say what I think, at least, which people know. And as I said, no one expects I'm an expert. I'm sorry, I thought you said that. I'm sure I missed some stuff, so you can, you can ask anything about bloggers. Do you, does, does any of you, has any of you ever considered doing that? Would you do it for like one event, or would you do it for a longer collaboration? Especially like after the talks we gave about co-creation, is that something you be willing to do now? Doing what? Do what? Collaborating with a blogger. Of course. Do you want him to? Oh, yeah. 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 Let them come to you if you have a nice event. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's what but, it depends. But giving them importance is also, is also good. You know, if there's a good fashion blogger and you're getting you're doing an event, it's nice to invite them personally. Oh, OK. Like that, that's really good. And one, you're giving them importance, which no one else does usually. So a kid, you should invite them or approach them. But you shouldn't. Like, like if, you shouldn't, if you don't know them, you can't send them your press release and expect them to write. That's the thing that's wrong to approach. But actually inviting them, Belakis, you should, you should always have a few bloggers and a few people from the social media community there. And they're always helping. If they just check in on Foursquare and Twitter, Kalas, people saw and know this guy and this girl and these people and dudes were there. But hey, always approach them. Well, I don't approach them. But just don't never send them content or expect them to publish it or tell them what to write. That's really bad. Like if someone just calls me and tells me, I think you should write this, this, this and that, I say okay and never publish. At least they email them back. I don't get the least to get your point there. I said, I'm not your fucking partner. I have a name. Email me back with my name. I said that to Leo Burnett. I want to address the issue of whether or not there are fashion bloggers. There are plenty of fashion bloggers. Plenty, yeah. <laughs> but Too many, even, actually. Yeah, a lot of them. But I think that none of them has had... Um, because, okay, so let's say you know the Like, he used to go and get the scoop and get the whatever and, like, dig, you know, through whatever to, to find good stories, okay? So I think if I had to diagnose why no fashion blogger has broken through mm -hmm. as like the fashion blogger in Lebanon, yeah. is that true? There is no great fashion yes. blogger, not even Nana. Like, she yeah. has a good blog, she's maybe one of the most active, yeah, but, but no one knows her as the reference in the same way that you know other blogs. But I think that, but, and this is again like our philosophy, my personal philosophy, but also as a, as a company, is you can help them become that person. You can, co in this case, think of co-creation. So it's not that you're paying them to write about you. It's that you're collaborating together to create great content, to give them good tools, to give them intelligence. And maybe one of them will be great. The thing is, no one can represent our brand. It's, it's not about representing your brand. brand. It's about yes. having the same values. It's not at all the same. Yeah, they should never they represent your brand. Yeah, not represent, but I know they cannot like talk about my brand because Again, but, but that's, that's not, that's don't talk about your brand. Talk but, about hey, that, that that's out of your hands. People are gonna talk about your brand whether you want it or not be you know, online today. So it's better to be on good terms with them than worse. Hello, when I said you know don't don't approach them relax, you should invite them to everything, Akid. It'd be awesome to have a blogger there and probably if you have fifty people, the ten people which are online are the ones that will actually have word of mouth spread. And you know, if you invite fifty people Old ladies can not taunt it. No, 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 no. You can get from salon here. Because if someone tweets and posts a photo on Instagram, everyone will know. So you, you need to have you need to have these people. As a Michigan of bloggers, at least influential people on Twitter. You yeah. can our uh, to, you know, good tweets. People who have Facebook pages. You should invite them. But invite them in a as good contamlo in the and give them some importance. And we're inviting you and invite LBC, Lorient, Le Jour, or you know, you guys are on the same caliber. Which Masalan about if invite uh, like a TV channel for an in-depth look or something like or bloggers just send them a press, press release or a cocktail for the show like give them like, the experience itself okay. like some car brand I like hatchback cars all the time so I get a lot of like whenever I get to know wow new family car or whatever I never drive them then no I don't want to but if this hatchback car I, I would go uh, one of the companies that released the hatchback car took the TVs on a, on a test drive here 
and they just sent us press release. And then they were like, why didn't you write about this? You like hatchback. I'm like, I'm sure what I'm going to write about. <laughs> you released it. Nothing is important about that. Now, they didn't give us as much importance as TVs. And no one, who watches a, a motor show on a TV? Like, a, like an actual, uh, of course, top gear. <laughs> and no one really watches it. So it would have been smarter to actually get a handful of bloggers to write about it. And at the end of the day, most of the audience of our bloggers are university students or fresh graduates or young professionals. There's not a lot of old people and small kids. Small kids don't read that much. Old people are still figuring out Facebook and Hegel. So, hey, so the blog part, you know, this audience is perfect for these things. First car, you know, making, setting their image with their fashion statements. You know, I think it's the perfect clubs, food, anything, energy drinks. You know, this is the perfect demographic for them, I think. I wanted to add to that, because there's also the element of, like, when you hear, like you said earlier, when you know, saying you should never pay a blogger, that might sound weird to you. you know, how do you trust someone, or how do you get someone to be excited about you if you're not paying them? That's because the blogger isn't using his blog to make money from the. No one will ever make money from the blog. Like, that's never going to be $200 here, $200 there, you're never going to feel the family. What you're doing with the blog sometimes, like what I did with mine, for example, was I was building up my personal brand. I turned it into a book for my book, I made money. So that was publishing, I signed deals, and so on. And I used the blog as like a springboard to do other things. So someone, like a fashion blogger, will probably use their blog at some point to go get a TV show. Or will use their blog to go do something, to be a stylist, and to go work on a shoot. So it's something. never your full-time job. Your ever. It's never your full-time job. It's part of your personal it's brand, but it really opens up. But they, they, set, like, they use it in, in the same way any marketer uses it, which means they, the blog is their tool for generating an audience, and then they sell them something else. Like their book or their app, or yeah. like let's say food bloggers, most of them have recipe books and iPhone apps, yeah. or whatever. Like they, they will make money from having generated this audience and converted it to buy a product. something else, yeah. not because from the content. Because I know it sounds suspicious to say like someone doesn't want money from you for something. No, no, of course. <laughs> no, like, but they know that somewhere else they're going to be doing something with this. Not to write in their yeah. building, they're going to do something with it somewhere else. Yeah, well, it can be, I mean, a lot of people just do it for fun. Okay. And, you know, I, I love writing, and if I see my hits drop, I'm sad. I'm not really, it doesn't really matter, because uh, the money, the non-existent money won't really change. But I get <laughs> sad personally. <laughs> I get sad, I, know, I, I want the hits to stay up. Well, I sort of like realize, you know, it's actually picking up, because the only, I think, mentionable person named Gina in Lebanon was the magician. Yeah. Yeah. And I used to get that a lot. Oh, do you know to ask her? No, no, never. No one ever says that. Now they say, ah, to buy a blog. So for me, that was you know, the tipping point in Khalas. People know who I am now. Uh, influence, is a, influence is a powerful, like when you feel yeah. that people are reading you and, and, you, and yeah. going to you for advice, or going for you, or like even if you just out for a drink, like I used to do. I, this doesn't happen because I don't update my, I, I don't live in Lebanon anymore, so I don't update my blog as bad as well. Uh, so when you're out and someone goes, man, I read that thing, it's it amazing. So awesome. and, uh, yeah, that makes your week. Yeah, like, yeah. That's worth the more the thousand really? dollars, two hundred dollars. Like so, you know, like you, so cool. like the motivation is different. You know? well, especially, as, mostly, I don't think it gets as many hate, as much hate as I do. I used to get a lot of hate. That's not anymore. <laughs> with the new, no, now he gives with it. the new trend, if, uh, you know, you get death threats, you get lawsuits. Death threats. Right. Right. Not right. for the fashion and clubbing. <laughs> <laughs> I also write about uh, <laughs> politics, religion, religion oh. these stuff. So I get, I used to get a lot of them. Because the nice thing is when the problem is that the people who are with you, they private message you, and one private message versus the 700 comments about uh, you know insulting me or attacking me or threatening are worth it. Oh, people think it doesn't really get to me, but every negative comment yeah. it, it gets to. You know, you know why? You get used to it. Because when people like, like, you never know who it really is. Like, let's say you're an, an actor, a musician, whatever. You get your negative comments like in a review. So you read a review and you're ready. You're like, okay, I'm going to read this review. <laughs> you sit there and you're like, ah, fuck, they didn't like it. But you're prepared. Whereas if you're a blogger, you're getting your comments in emails. Like, I'll be like walking home from work at 10 p.m. in the yeah. rain in Paris. <laughs> and I'll get like, you're the fucking worst writer I've ever. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm on the fucking subway. And like, I've had a tough day. Like, you know, it's in your personal life. Yeah. It's not. It's not a formalized review where you're ready for it. It's so, constant. So oh, it's it's by so anonymous people, or human beings, and they really they really go they really go the extra yeah. mile. Like sometimes some friends call me and they're like, they actually physically come sometime and meet you somewhere and. Uh, I got my car uh, busted uh, uh, twice. Oh. Yeah, and you have Gina's blood on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's okay, and it, if, if you think of it in the timeline of things, 
before there used to be lawsuits with that first way. Now it's like they're apologetic. They're like, okay, maybe you should be more respectful, or I respectfully disagree. We're, you know, we're gonna go to court with this. We're gonna blah blah blah, and it, it backfires all the time. And I'm really, I'm really extremist in that sense. And I'm, I'm freedom of speech, No matter what you want to say, anything it goes. So usually, when someone files a lawsuit against you, you pull the blog post and you stay silent till the uh, court decision is out. And I don't do that. When I found out, and you know, like some uh, TV personality was uh, just filed a lawsuit against me, the same second I put everything I had on him. And that was amazing. Why? And it backfired so hard on him, he didn't know what he wanted to do. Well, why did he do that? What did you do? Excuse me, why not to react? I posted did everything he did, every single detail. Because oh, you, you know, posted it? Of course. Oh, of course. Yeah. And I never removed the post he had on. And at the end of the day, I won the, the court battle. Oh, and he lost his job court. eventually. Because I, I fixated on him and I, was, I <laughs> said, I'm going to end his career. And I did. And very, <laughs> doing nothing bad, just changing public opinion. And sort of baiting him into writing what, you know, saying what I wanted to say, which I know wouldn't go on national TV, and I'll get him fired, which he got fired because of it. So, I'm really extremist in that sense, so. It might be dangerous for your life, <laughs> It might, but at the end of the day, I'm not that big of a problem for anyone to be that insistent on. And uh, if you go to a judge, most of the time they have no idea what the blog is. Most judges are 18 years old. So when you go there and they're like, what's this? They'll be like, which is good for us for now. And luckily enough, censorship in Lebanon hasn't been that extreme. And you know, we have a few cases which you always highlight, but compared to like the Gulf or somewhere else where you can't even go on Reddit, most of the subreddits follow us. We're still a bit way ahead. The only problem we have is the speed, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. yeah. But uh, freedom-wise, it's all good. And if you need to ban a website, you need a court order in Lebanon, which is a hassle for most people. Mm -hmm. So we don't ban it. And every day you write a blog, every single day? Sometimes four or five a day. Wow. Sometimes a week, nothing. It oh. depends, really. Yeah. I don't have a schedule. Whenever the stuff comes, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll so write So you have a day job? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I freelance copyright. And I was working consulting in the States for that. Hey, this isn't my job. I wish it could be. I'm sorry, what is your job? Consultant? I used to be, yeah. You're not? I freelance copyright most of the time. It's, it's why, what? It's, uh, copyright. 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 It's when you, when you write stuff for, uh, ad, for ad, ads or businesses. Okay. On you make website, sure it's all. If you want anyone all website, to exactly. Website. Presentation and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. It's boring. It's it gets the, the bills paid. I am working on a, on a new startup. I don't like it. Interrupt hurts you. I mean, in your freelance job, because now you get all this reputation, so people would like to come to you because they know how to exactly. write. Exactly. But and most of the right. stuff I do is not for Lebanon. The Lebanese people don't pay on time, and uh, uh -huh. they always want to dumb it down every time. You know, everything you write gets edited so much. So I work with Qatar, Dubai, mm -hmm. these guys for brands I don't even know about yeah. most of the time. Yeah. This is just the paying the bills thing. Never affects the blog. And to go back to the invite bloggers to your invite yeah. events, the worst thing that I hate and I usually get is that they make you feel that they're using you, yeah. that they're using your blog. And they want you to write about them and they make it so obvious so you hate it. You hate the brand and you don't ever want to talk to them or in, 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 Refer them to anyone. So don't make the blogger feel like, you know, hey, I'm inviting you, but you have to write about me. Mm. Or they send you an email uh, like two days later, it was great having you there. Uh, we're waiting to read Except your blog link. post. Uh, send us the link when you write your blog post. Don't ever do that. Oh, when you're leaving, when will you post this? Hey, when will you post about it? Like, and I've never approached two bloggers. Like now, now that I'm in, on the other side, sometimes we have projects we want to contact bloggers for. I never approached the bloggers the same way, and never on the same medium, and never, like, Gino, I said, like, you remember Quick Island, like, I'll send him a Facebook message saying, check out this band, I know you don't like this kind of stuff, just see if you like it, maybe write about it, the story might be interesting more than the music to you, and like, just, uh, and you didn't, you know? yeah, I don't think so. Sorry. But no, it's fine, like, I don't even remember, but so, no, and, like, then I, if I'm going to another blogger, I'll use another, you know, I'll, I'll talk to them in a different yeah. way, if it's a blogger I don't know, I'll get someone to introduce us in an email, then I'll continue, and it was very informal, very, 
you know, it's like there's no, like you can't, it's going to take more time than a press release, but it's going to also ensure that you're building relationships. Hey, let me, really, you want, you want the blogger not to come one time, you want to build something which lasts, so you, they have to be sort of like your friend. But at the end of the day, most of the people like I write about, eventually I become their friend. Everyone thinks that they're my friends because that I write about them. That's not true. Most of the things I write about, because of what I write, like they share it to thank you, blah, 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 we become friends. But, and I never treat them like, uh, Hey, never make them feel used. Never ask them, sure, when are you going to post? Have them post whenever they want, if they want to post. Have them. Keep inviting them, and if they didn't write about this one, maybe they'll write about the next. So. And if, 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 you're, if it's interesting enough for them, they will surely they write will. about it. And don't even ask it. Don't bother asking. I have a question. So if you're a company, and you're a company that has a blog, mm -hmm. okay. is that related? Like, is it relatable to like the blogs that you're talking about, yeah. or is it totally? It's a, totally. Not, like, In some aspects, maybe. But I think when a company or brand has a blog, it's more to uh, give it a human side of it. Like everything is so copyrighted on the website. So on the blog, is the things. Masan, if the CEO wants to talk to the people, he writes it himself, or she writes it himself, herself. So it's nice in that sense, but they can't really write their opinion about another brand. It would, it would look weird or mean. Maybe they could. Yeah. Whereas an independent blogger can write whatever he wants. Because the pages of blog can't really be like that. You know what? I check pages of blogs to find out if there's something. Uh, so if WhatsApp goes down, I go on their blog to see what's happened. So it's sort of like uh, the interface, the, the professional interface of it. Very on Twitter, right? But say the company blog or brand blog can't be the same as the independent blog. It's, uh, it's yeah. But you really need, really need it. The okay. content management, the way to create content around the brand. Yeah, you need to attract more people. It's a totally different perspective. Yeah, and it's an anchor point for your social media communication as well. I was actually talking right. about this a minute, like an hour ago. Um, you know, social media communications are so important. Like, you know, I really, really think that even if it's just a blog, like I know that a lot of you don't have websites or don't want to afford them or don't know what to do with them. But if you don't have an anchor point to all of this communication, then the only, okay, you're benefiting on social media, but you're not owning any of your clients. Yeah, and when I, exactly. when I say owning, it's, so when, when you have to go through Facebook to communicate and you don't have an anchor point, which is your website, and if you can't can do a website, start with a blog, these people will connect directly to you. The point of the game is to get as much people as you can to go through you and not through all of your channels. You okay. To get them closer to you, so you have direct access. So you can do direct email marketing, call, send them an item that you think they're gonna like, or whatever okay. it is. Plus, think of it, if you wanna search for something on a Facebook page, it takes you hours to scroll mm -hmm. down. Whereas a blog, it's, it's forever there. It's like an archive of everything. Yeah. So you, maybe you can lead them, you can never find an old tweet ever, or an old Facebook post. But so when you post them on the blog too, first, you could post a, a blog post on your blog, take that photo, Put a small caption, put it on your Facebook page. Because okay. the photo gets shared better. And they get hooked, the photo on the they can see it. And if they ever want to go back, they'll just go, hopefully there'll be a search widget. And they'll find it immediately, because you can categorize it, create menus, different sections. Whereas the Facebook page is just a timeline, which gets lost with the everything else. Yeah, everything so the blog is necessary. Done every day. Think of it as an archive, if you want, of everything you've done, which and anyone can access anytime. And in your particular case, creative space, you have much more leeway in what you can do because it's a non-profit and it's, so you can talk about a much wider range of things and with a much like, more informal tone. Uh, like yeah, it's like you have a cause and you have yeah. a clear set of values. That's, that should be easier for yeah. you than anyone else. So in terms of you and when you first started the blog, how, how did, what was your way of getting it out there? You just typed it and then your friend, like, just put it on, just Facebook? Everything started with Facebook. And your friend started sharing it and stuff? So when you share it, uh, with your friends and your friends, we share it. Uh, that's, that's the viral. It never went viral. viral. So that's the viral aspect of it. Because mm -hmm. no one will ever go and type the URL of a blog. Very rarely, unless like they really love it. People will just maybe scrolling through and they say, yeah. "Oh, this is nice. This is nice. Oh, Genius blog. Okay, I'll open it." Because they never really. You know, it's always number one uh, source of hits if you want. It's always either search engines or Facebook. Never anything else. Demo, demo. And if you want the loyal readers, they either subscribe by RSS or by email. So they never actually access the blog. So the hits that are coming there aren't the, if you want, the core. I really feel I know. So in my, in my case, I send the whole post in, by email. So they never even have to open the blog. Because mm -hmm. that's not, you know, I'm not 
Kurdish kill hit, I'm getting money from. So I don't really care. As long as as many people as possible as reading, that's what I like. So, hey, I guess everything's on Facebook. Everyone's on Facebook. And on Facebook, the stuff stay on the timeline longer. On Twitter, they don't. Mm -hmm. then, there's, a, there's a trend in Lebanon, and we keep following so many people, and they follow you back. How about if everyone thinks that they only see your followers? But then I always look at the following. If I see following us on 50,000, I know you're probably not a serious okay. Twitter person. Yeah, I mean, no one can read 50,000 people's tweets at the same time and, and you know, comprehend what's happening. I think if it's more than 1,000 or 2,000, it's, it's a bit hard to keep up. And then Anna, I keep, like every while, I keep some clean up the people I follow. I don't really care who follows me, I keep, the more the better. So I think the ratio of following to followers is really important on Twitter. Joan gives much importance. If you want to get the credibility as in someone who actually knows how to use Twitter and actually you know, reads the tweets they find. So Twitter guy doesn't last long. So Facebook, I think, is the, unfortunately, is the main thing. But then at Lebanon, everyone goes on Twitter, spend five minutes, don't get anything, and they leave. <laughs> okay, so it's a bit for the elite social media users to actually have the patience to find to uh, understand it. Whereas everyone is on Facebook: your moms, your grandma, your aunts, <laughs> people who don't even know how to, masan, about it, write proper grammar. And everyone's on Facebook because Facebook's easy, and you have to be on it. Whereas Twitter is the next level, and they're really usually a mean bunch. Come in, so. Don't get uh, on their bad side. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. Thank you.